is so good. And he does chase us down. Has he ever done that for you? Well, happy Mother's Day. Today we'll be celebrating Mother's Day. You may be seated. On May 9th, 1914, President Woodrow Wilson issued a presidential proclamation that officially established the first National Mother's Day holiday celebrating America's mothers. Thank you, Lord. I'm glad I had a mother. <laughs> I had a good mother. I had a mother that pushed me. Erica Bodor said this, your mother's hands are magic. They heal pain. They are in tiny homes in this world. And when the world feels too big, a mother's hands become even bigger. A mother's hands are a refuge. Yes. This kind of sounds like God, doesn't it? When the world gets a little too big, his hands come down and cover us. Mothers are willing to do some amazing things for their children. Amen? Amen. 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 We're going to give you a few examples. <laughs> you know, they're ready to instill faith and wisdom and, and trust and, you know, and they're kind of like a, a big mama bear. Kind of lallygog, yeah, you can lallygog around, just be mellow and... The kids can push and even jump on their backs, but let a predator come. Let some kind of danger come. What happens? The teeth come out. The claws come out. Rawr. Something's going on here that I don't like. And a growl breaks the darkness and the silence. Things like Get out of the road, a car's coming. Don't touch that stove, it's hot. And don't take candy from strangers. Mama bears, they love their cubs. God is our mama bear, and he loves the cubs. And he's willing to say, don't do this. And he's willing to give you a spanking if need be. Don't do this. Why? Because he loves us and he's willing to bring us closer to him. He's trying to bring us to a place to where we love him in the same way. We have some biblical examples of mothers. Um, I'm just going to give you two quick ones. Uh, in Matthew 20, 20 and 21. It says this, Then came the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons. Do you get that? We're talking about two apostles. And the mother is coming to God for her sons. Hmm. He said on, and and she, she fell down and started worshiping him. Nothing like buttering God up, right? <laughs> Only mom knows how to do that, right? God, you are so great. You are so good. Jesus, you know everything. And you know how important it is to me that you have one son on the right side and one son on the left side. Do you think you could do that for me? What do you think the apostles were thinking? The two boys were saying, hmm, this, is, this might be pretty cool. Can you imagine being the right hand of God in his kingdom? 
I don't know where that happened. And I don't know how many people were around. But I can just see the glares of the other apostles. (laughs) Who in the world does this woman think she is? She's a mama bear trying to do what she can for her cubs. And isn't that what we do? We do what we can for our cubs. And God does the same thing what he can for his cubs. And we're his cubs. And we're the ones that receive the benefits from it. How awkward do you think she felt doing that? I can picture it. Get out of my way. Jesus. Can you picture that? Mama bear. I can picture it. And that's the hunger that God wants us to have for him. Get out of my way. Whatever it takes, God, here am I. I I am willing to push back, push by, push through, under, over, do whatever is necessary to get into your presence to be one of your cubs. Whatever it takes. Mamas are willing to do some things. Here's a better one. Can you imagine being 13, 14, 15 years old? Pop. Angel standing in front of you. You are highly favored. God is with you. And by the way, you're about to become impregnated by the Holy Ghost. And you're about to carry... God's child, and you're going to rear God's child, and don't mess it up because the whole world is counting on you. (laughs) Do you think she had pressure on her? Wow, I can't even fathom that. But Mama Bear stepped into the role and said, I'm willing to do this because God is saying to do this. This is part of being a Mama Bear. This is part of the love of a mama. You know, sometimes your job becomes very difficult. When you have to discipline your children and you don't want to, or they do something that's so cute and you're trying not to smile because you know you still have to discipline them, because they know how to work around, you know. They, they kind of have this, this way that just knows how to push that button in you. Oh, mommy, you're so pretty. How do you discipline them? You know, maybe we could take a cue from them. God, you are so great. I know I just messed up. But man, you are so great. And I'm so thankful to be with you. And I'm so appreciative that you're my dad. And you're my mom. You're the head of the church. You're one I can count on. You're one that I can call to. You're one that will, I can pray to. You're one that I'm able to reach to. And you will reach down and touch me. This little insignificant little speck in eternity. And God, you are willing to touch me. Wow. Now that's, that was just what I was going to say. That is awesome. Because God loves you that much. And God loves moms that much. And God shows moms how to be moms. He's that example. He's the one that is willing to do whatever is necessary. Whatever is necessary. To bring us closer to him. Bring us into his kingdom. So mom, I know sometimes your job is very daunting. Scary sometimes. But doing what is right in God's sight. And when you don't have the strength, we can call upon him. And he will give us the strength. And when we don't have the wisdom, we can call upon him. 
and he will give us that wisdom. And when we don't understand what's going on, we can still call upon him. And even if we seems like we don't get any wisdom, just stand in his presence. Just stand in his presence. So thank you, moms, for being moms, for putting yourself aside, for being willing to go the extra mile, for being willing to give for others. And it doesn't just happen to their children because it just seems to be in their nature. They're willing to help others at the same time. Amen. So, if we'll stand. I want to thank you, moms. And I want to just say right here and now, you're awesome. You're awesome. Let's give them an applause. Thank you so much, Jesus. I want to add my appreciation to our ladies, especially... um, Sister Hart, who served many years as the First Lady of Acts 2 Ministries, congratulations. And my wife, they have, uh, the pastor's wife has a role that nobody else has, and they deserve honor and respect for that. So we've got something a little special that I've asked my wife and some ladies just to celebrate mothers for a few minutes here. So let's just let, let the ladies recognize the value that God has given them. I'll ask my wife to come. Happy Mother's Day to all of you who I haven't greeted yet this morning. So thankful for a group of mothers who really do put God first in their families' lives and influence their kids for good. That's not as um, common as we would like for it to be, but I'm thankful for all of you. There's a mother that I admire, and um, I never met her because she lived long, long ago, but her story is in the Bible. She was a Moabite woman, and she was from a country that was one of Israel's traditional enemies, but she married an Israelite, and joined his family while they were living, the Israelite family were living in Moab. She's one of the most famous women in the Bible, which is strange when you realize she wasn't even a Jew. And her name was Ruth. Ruth the Moabite. And the book of Ruth is her story, how she met and married the Israelite man who came with his family during a time of famine in Israel. But after 10 years, he died, his brother died, and his father died. So all the women were widows, and um, Naomi, who was the mother, she, uh, she was in a foreign land. She had no way to support herself. So she decided that she was going to go back to Israel. And Ruth decided that she would go with her. And I began to wonder, what would Ruth's motivation be? to go to Israel. It's a strange country. Um, She didn't know anybody there except her mother-in-law, Naomi. And let me just remind you of some of the history between Israel and Moab. I didn't put all this together until I started looking through it, but Israel, you'll remember as they were journeying, journeying through the wilderness to the promised land, they began to uh, fight off enemies. Well, they came to um, the Amorite people, and they defeated them. Well, the Moabite king, Balak, he saw this, and he said, well, wait a minute. We don't want that to happen to us. So he tried to hire Balaam, who was a Jew, to put a curse on the Jewish people so that they would not be able to enter their land. And you know that story, how it wasn't successful, and finally Balaam actually blessed the Jewish people, instead of cursing them, which made Balak, the king of Moab, very angry. And um, in, number, in Deuteronomy 23, it declares that the Moabites were forbidden from entering the assembly of the Lord because of the actions of Balak and Balaam. So that's one uh, point where they butted heads. And then in Numbers, we read that the Israelites intermarried with the Moabite people and began worshiping Moabite gods. In Numbers 25, God commanded Moses to stamp out the Moabite influence. 
And this is what it says. Take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So that alone might make someone who is from Moab hesitate to go into Israel, in my opinion. <laughs> and then we have another head-to-head. -head. The Moabite king Eglon formed an alliance with the Ammonites and the Amalekites in the period of the judges. Together they rose up against Israel and subjected them to a humiliating defeat. God thwarted the Moabite menace through the judge Ehud, who assassinated Eglon. So Ruth had to know about some of these incidences that had happened and how she probably would not be that welcome into Israel. But something drove her, I think, and I, I do think she loved her mother-in-law and wanted to help her probably. But I'm wondering if maybe she um, also began to love the God that Naomi served. I think that would be a strong motivation. But whatever it was, we don't know because Scripture doesn't tell us. We read in Ruth, the first chapter, that Ruth said, Don't urge me to leave you or to go back from you. Where, I, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. This is a scripture that you hear used in weddings sometimes because it speaks of deep love, commitment, loyalty, and in fact, the, booth, the, sorry, the book of Ruth is considered a love story between Ruth and Boaz, but also between God and mankind, how God redeemed us to him. Another interesting fact is that Boaz, who was the redeemer in this story of Ruth and Naomi, because he was a, a kin, he was a relative, the Bible calls it a kinsman, one reason he might have had unusual compassion for Ruth is because his mother was Rahab. And you remember the story of the woman in Jericho that she, she sheltered the spies. And because of that, God said, I'm going to save all of you and your family. A very interesting connection that I, I didn't realize was there. So his mother was also a foreigner in a strange land. And um, so Rahab had Boaz. And then, you know how the story goes. It was a love story. Boaz and Ruth, they had a courtship. They got married. In Ruth 4, the Lord enabled Ruth to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son. She lost her other sons. Now she has a son again. And they named him Obed. And through Obed's son, Jesse, God brings a shepherd boy named David into the world. God transforms little David into a man after his own heart, makes him king of Israel. And through this king, God eventually ushers in the king of the world, Jesus Christ, who is our ultimate kinsman redeemer. So Ruth was living her life. She didn't probably start out to do this dramatic thing. She just was surviving her life. She, she, didn't, she was a widow. She had no way to support herself. So she just went to Israel where she just happened to meet Boaz. And God put it all together. And that's how God orchestrates our lives. You know, it's like, I'm living today. I have a child. I have to do the wash. I have to make the meal. <laughs> I've got to clean the house, spend time with my kids. But God is doing something you don't know about. Yeah. He's, he's weaving all the parts of it together into this beautiful story. And how in the world could Ruth have ever orchestrated all of that? To be in the lineage of Jesus. I, you could try your whole life to try to plan that, and it would never work out. <laughs> so we only have to do our little part. And, and so whenever you're 
feeling frustrated, mothers, and you're feeling like, what am I even doing? Am I even affecting anyone? Am I influencing anyone? Well, you have someone right there in your home, that little child. You can influence. You can share your faith. You can live your faith every day. And you never know where those little seeds are going, but you just keep on doing it. And then one day, you see the finished product, and it's so beautiful. And you stand back and you say, thank you, God. (laughs) I don't know how you did it, but you did it. I have a poem by Helen Steiner Rice called A Mother's Love. If you like poems, she has some great poems. And this I thought was beautiful. A mother's love is something that no one can explain. It is made of deep devotion and of sacrifice and pain. It is endless and unselfish and enduring come what may, for nothing can destroy it or take that love away. It is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaking, and it never fails or falters, even though the heart is breaking. It believes beyond believing when the world around condemns, and it glows with all the beauty of the rarest, brightest gems. It is far beyond defining. It defies all explanation, and it still remains a secret like the mysteries of creation. A many-splendored miracle men cannot understand, and another wondrous evidence of God's tender, loving hand. Happy Mother's Day. There is no influence so powerful as that of the mother, says Sarah Josepha Hale. I looked up the definition of two words, mothering, the activity of bringing up a child as a mother, or relating to or characteristic of a mother, especially in being caring, protective, and kind. And then I looked up influencer. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, an influencer is a person or group that has the ability to influence the behavior or opinions of others. And then I begin to think about in the Bible, there were some good moms, like Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was there by his side through it all, or Eunice and Lydia, who passed on their love of Jesus to Timothy. And then there were some bad moms. Like in Second Chronicles, it tells how evil King Ahaziah was in some measure because his mother was his counselor in doing wickedly. She was a terrible influence. Or Herodias, who influenced her daughter to request the death of John the Baptist. Today in this room, there are praying moms, loving moms, fun moms, strict moms, crafty moms, athletic moms, quiet moms, loud moms, Moms who can cook delicious cuisine, moms who burn the toast, (laughs) elegant moms, messy moms, outdoor moms, working moms, work-at-home moms, moms who mess up but get up to try again, moms who need to give a little more grace to themselves, all different kinds of moms. But most importantly, there are moms who love Jesus and his word and who are loved by him, and who try to do their best to be good influencers in the kingdom. Moms who try to keep no record of wrong, try to bear all things, believe all things, hope all things. You love unconditionally like Jesus does. And if for some reason you didn't have a good motherly influence in your life, God can bring you healing. In here, there are also moms who may not have given birth to a natural child, but in God's plan, may be used in mothering or influencing others. God has a unique way of flowing through someone who has a desire to show motherly love to another individual. He puts people in our lives for different reasons and gives us the privilege of being an influence on them. Many years before I received my current title, Mama, the Lord helped me be at peace with being a mom influencer to my siblings to my nieces and nephews, and to my friends. And then he blessed me with my sweet Hannah. Every day I try my best to influence her according to God's word. And a lot of those days I go to God and submit a request for a do-over. But God in his mercy somehow takes it all and uses it for good. So today I would encourage each one of you ladies to enjoy the season you're in. Celebrate each day. Share the love of God. Share the wisdom he has given you. 
You are each unique flowers that God put in his garden. Let his sweet spirit and love flow from you to someone else. Your words can bring death or your words can bring life. You are an influencer to the people God put in your life. Be life givers with your prayers, your words, your actions, and with your love. God can use you to make a profound difference in someone's life. Moms, you are rare and precious jewels. And as A.A. A. Milne in Winnie the Pooh says, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, smarter than you think, and loved more than you know. Watching little brother while you went shopping, 25 cents. For taking out the trash, one dollar. Getting a good report card, five dollars. Raking the leaves, two dollars. Total load, 14.75. Well, I stood there looking at him expecting and a thousand memories flashed through my mind. So I picked up the pen and turning the paper over, this is what I wrote. For the nine months I carried you growing inside me, no charge. For the nights I sat up with you, doctor. He wrote, paid in full. When you had it all up, the full cost of my love is no charge. Thank you. There are sweet words we often associate with motherhood. Words like love, gentleness patience, etc. But please, let me talk for a few minutes from my heart to all the broken mothers out there. There is another word associated with mothering, and that word is pain. If you have not been hurt by a child of yours yet, Mom, well, what would you like me to say? Sometimes motherhood can bring real grief. Sometimes the charges a grown child brings can be of a different nature. They can be charges leveled at you. And then insist 
I'm sorry, it seems there is a growing trend of blaming all your ills on your parents and then insisting they hear about them. If this has ever happened to you, you know it hurts. Their laundry list of your faults and shortcomings, whether accurate or not, can leave you feeling like your child has become your enemy. I've learned that my real enemy would like to use my children at times like this. I'm also learning that God would like to answer my prayers at times like this. He would change generational strongholds in both myself and my children if we let him. There is a word the Bible gives us to counteract pain, and that word is rejoice. The Apostle Paul told the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. You will need to learn to lean on something greater than you to do that. Jesus tells us a more specific time to rejoice. When men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say, All manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. He then adds an even greater dimension to the rejoicing and be exceeding glad. Let's take a look at the Bible meaning of that word rejoice. It means to be cheerful, calmly happy, and well off. I'd like to share from my own hard-earned lessons, hard-learned lessons also, six ways that this is possible. The first one, drop the charges. Lay all accusations and charges at the feet of the Lord and don't retaliate. Amen. Number pull, number two, pull out those arrows. Go to the Lord for a correct assessment of each charge and let him resolve and heal wherever needed. Did I say that was easy? Did I say that happened overnight? <laughs> Number three, <laughs> realize you are not God. And these children were his before they were yours. You are his representative, and you may not do that job perfectly. Number four, put your grown child down. They are too heavy. Stop carrying them. They need to learn to walk with God for themselves. Hand them over to Daddy. He'll teach them, carry them, correct them, and rightly judge them. Number five, keep praying for and loving your children from a distance if necessary. Stay sweet. Keep the faith. Keep a sense of humor and keep no record of wrong, yours or theirs. And number six, carry on. You were his child before you were their mother. Your life, all of it, is a gift from God. He has a plan for the rest of your time on earth. So be cheerful, calmly happy, and well off. Because the cost of his love for you, no charge. In preparing for this reading today, I came across this quote. A mother understands what a child does not say. Growing up as a painfully shy and introverted child, I've definitely found this to be true. I'm told that I was my mother's shadow when I was little. I could always be found by her side. She intuitively knew what I needed or wanted, often without me having to say the words. As I grew older, she always seemed to know what I was feeling, even when I couldn't say the words, and I often couldn't, as I had trouble expressing my emotions. She always seemed to know what I needed to hear, or when I just needed her to sit quietly with me, because sometimes her presence was enough. I, I didn't sleep well when I was a child, so I had this habit of, when I couldn't sleep, I would get up to go see my mom, and instead of waking her up, I would just stand there and stare at her. Um, and then she would wake up and jump and be like, what are you doing? And I'd be like, I couldn't sleep. 
Um, and growing up, I realized how terrifying that is because um, that happened. I was watching my niece one night, and she did that to me. So I was like, I'm sorry, Mom. I did that so many times. I'm so sorry. Um, but I'm so thankful for the gift that is motherhood and for the gift of my mother. I have four siblings, and my mother has never been short on love to pass around. She showed me how to love your family with all your heart and how family is the most important thing. She loved her mother very dearly, which in turn showed me how a daughter ought to love her mother. She showed me how to be a lady and how to be a woman of God. She showed me how to pray, how to read the Bible, and how to be still in God's presence. She showed me how to be kind and compassionate and how to be a friend to those who may seem friendless. Above all else, she showed me what it looks like to truly and deeply love Jesus and live your life for him. I'm thankful for all the women God has placed in my life that have loved me, cared for me, and helped shape me into who I am today. I'm thankful for the beautiful examples that I have all around me that will someday help me with my own family. Um, I'd like to end with this reading of a poem I came across in dedication to all the mothers. It's called, When You Thought I Wasn't Looking. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you hang my first painting on the fridge, and I wanted to paint another one. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you sneak the dog an extra treat, and I saw that it was good to be kind. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you make my favorite cake for me, and I knew that the little things are the special things. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you praying in the other room, and I knew that there is a loving God to talk to. When you thought I wasn't looking, I felt you kiss me goodnight, and I felt loved. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw tears come from your eyes, and I learned that sometimes things hurt, but it's okay to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw that you cared about me, and it made me want to be everything I could possibly be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked, and I wanted to say thank you for all the things I saw when you thought I wasn't looking. Hi. <laughs> Oh, it is so daunting being up here, but I know you guys are awesome and great and show so much grace. <laughs> um, I've been touched so much by everything that you guys have said. It just oh, it makes me think. Um, when I was younger in high school, I used to have a poem. I just It just really stuck out to me as a kid, and it was by Langston Hughes, and it's called Mother to Son. Um, I'm just going to read that. Um, quickly, and then I just had something else to share. <sighs> okay. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it, and splinters, and boards torn up, and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time, I've been a climbing on, and reaching landings, and turning corners, and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you sit down on the steps cause you find it's kinda hard. Don't you fall now. For eyes are still going, honey. Eyes are still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. That always stuck out to me because it talks about how moms just keep pushing on. And while she's dealing with things going through her life, she's encouraging you, her children, to push forward. Um, motherhood has long been considered a blessing. Um, if we go to Genesis 17, 16, God says that he will bless Sarai by doing what? Making her a mother of nations. Then in Genesis 24, 60, Rebecca's family blessed her in this manner. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions. Motherhood is a ministry. Moms throughout the ages have provided guidance. They've acted as counselors and confidants. In 2 Chronicles 22, verse 3, Ahaziah, his mother was his counselor to do wickedly. In 2 Chronicles 25, verse 1 and 2, you find Amaziah, and his mother's name was Johadan of Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Second Chronicles 26, 3 to 4, you find Uzziah. And his mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, 
2 Chronicles 27, 1 to 2. <laughs> Jotham, another king. His mother's name also was Jerusha, the daughter of Zadok. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. One more, one more. <laughs> Second Chronicles 29, verse 1 and 2. Hezekiah, another king. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Not many women are mentioned by name in the Bible. These are examples of those who have made a notable difference for good and bad in their children's lives. God noticed their efforts to guide their children and made it known from generation to generation. You steer the atmosphere of your home. You provide words of wisdom and instruction. Moms, you speak life to your family and what you do matters. What you say matters. You matter. What does a good mom look like? She looks like you. She's not perfect. She's just right. She pushes forward at the cost of herself. Mom, if you've ever felt less than, don't. If you've ever wanted to give up, I'm glad you didn't. If you thought you weren't enough, you are. You are precious. You are priceless. You are wise and intuitive. You are worth far above what any one person could give or could say. You are wanted. You are valuable. You are blessed. Many people say it's what you do as a mom that's important. But I think it's more who you are. <laughs> because when you are, you will do. It will just flow out of you. I think talking about mothers is very emotional. <laughs> and um, because it's so deep, it's one of those relationships that there's just, there's not another one like it. Not even with those people who are very, very close to you, even your husband or your siblings. Having a connection with a child that is born of you can't describe it unless you experience it, I think. But having um, raised a child from birth to adulthood, now 35 years old, I look back and I, I realize God must have given me some wisdom to do some things because I didn't know to do them. I think it's kind of like Brother Ford said, you feel your way along it's in the dark and you, you do your best and you love as hard as you can and and you pray that God has grace for you to take you through. <laughs> it was a wonderful journey. It still is. Um, but I realize even now more, more than ever that you can't shield your child from everything and there always comes a time in our life when you are alone. You, you have to make a stand. You have to make a choice one way or the other. And that's whenever the faith that has been instilled in you kicks in. It takes you over. It takes you past temptations and helps you make good choices and keeps you on the path. And hopefully it causes you to seek for God for yourself if you don't already have that. Because that's the only way you're going to get through life and make good choices yourself as the child. So I thank God today that he walked with me and he walks with me. Now I'm in a different journey of life with grandkids and that's a whole different story. <laughs> God has been faithful and he's been good. I came across this song and it's called Give You Faith. <clears throat> Because I feel like that's one of the, the most important things, like I've already said, that we can give to our child to influence them by our faith so that they desire to get their own faith. I 
I see your tiny face, <clears throat> your fingers wrapped in mine. <clears throat> I wonder how I'll raise this precious gift of life. I'd give you all my money, but you can't buy what you need. I'd show you going to preach a sermon, but just leave you another thought. might seem a little strange where I'm going with this on Mother's Day, but I want to talk just a minute about Job, because he reminds me of the beauty and the uniqueness that's available to us as human beings, including the evidence on earth that God is good. And I believe a key to interpreting the whole book of Job, which was the first book probably written of the Bible, and it's probably a key to understanding the whole Bible, is found in Job chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, the devil talking to God, does Job fear God for no reason? Doth Job fear God for naught? The devil came to God and he claimed these jokers, they're just in it for what they can get. Mankind doesn't have it in them to be selfless. And, and he kind of believes that. And that's why advertising doesn't appeal to your better side. It, it appeals to your selfishness. And the devil says that people love God as the giver and they love the gifts that he gives them, not really who he is. They, they love the fact that he gives. Or they, they serve him because he's going to keep them out of hell and take them to heaven. The devil doesn't believe that you have it in you just to be a decent, loving human being. 
Job was given this distinct honor in history of proving the devil wrong. God said, I don't believe that. God said, have you, have you considered my servant Job? I don't think he'll do me that way. I think Job will love me no matter what his life goes like. I think he'll love me even if things go badly for him and, and they negotiate. And the whole book of Job is this, about this negotiation and how God allows the enemy to actually do some stuff to Job and how Job at first feels offended because he's been a good boy and he shouldn't get these bad things. It didn't make sense to him. And his friends came along and said, you probably deserve this. And they threw out a bunch of bad theology and God shows up and he sets the record straight. And Job ends up saying, you know what, God, I don't care what you do in my life. I don't care what path my life takes. I am going to trust you. I'm going to love you. And he proved the devil wrong. He proved God right. He proved God's goodness. He proved God's goodness is not what we think it is. God's goodness is not everything going hunky-dory for you. So God needed some flesh and blood to prove his goodness. Some of you might be familiar with another person that proved this. She experienced some great difficulties, and yet she lived a happy life and a fruitful life. Her name was Frances Jane Van Alstine. She was born just about 50 miles north of New York City. She lived in Bridgeport for a while. She lived in Manhattan for a while. But at six weeks old, she caught a cold, and then she got inflammation in her eyes, and she went blind. And then at six months, her father died. So this blind girl was raised by her mother and her maternal grandmother, who loved on her, and they grounded her in Christian principles, and they worked on her memorization skills. She was born in 1820. She lived till she was 94. But being born in 1820 blind, you didn't have Braille. You didn't have books on tape. You didn't, you didn't have a lot of things. Uh, she was in a situation where she could have just been mad at God. She could have been angry at the world. She could have said, what do I have to offer? But this woman because of her mother and her grandmother, she memorized scriptures. And when she was eight years old, she wrote her first poem. And then she began to write songs. And by the time she died at 94, she had written 8,000 hymns. And she had 100 million copies in print in the 1800s. She's also known for working in a rescue mission, a blind lady. And by the end of the 19th century, she was a household name. She wrote, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. She wrote, to God be the glory for all he has done. She wrote the song, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Most of you know her by the name Fanny Crosby. Fanny married Mr. Alstein, but she kept her pen name by his insistence for the writing. She'd written so many hymns, and she kept his name for legal purposes. She uh, married a blind man, and they had a daughter who died as an infant. And at that time, she wrote the song, Safe in the Arms of Jesus. We look at people like that, or some of you might know names like Johnny Erickson Tata. It's like you look at people who got a bad deal, and they showed, they proved that you can love God, and God can use you, and you can have a fruitful, wholesome, good life in spite of everything that's dealt to you. There are people who embrace the life that God has given given them, and they live it with everything. They don't spend their time whining about their situation. They don't tell everybody who will listen how bad they have it. They just take what they have, and they say, God gave me this life. This is the life I'm going to live. And in doing so, they prove his goodness. They prove that 
Life can be good no matter what. They prove that God can give an abundant life no matter what happens. And there's a lot of people out there that don't know that. They don't believe that. They need somebody with flesh on them to show everybody else that you could be a good, happy, fulfilled, loving person. In fact, some of you people would be surprised to hear your stories because you're loving and happy and, and whole and, and they don't know that you went through some things that should have left you broken and helpless, angry. So I see a parallel between Job and all of you mothers and I would say beyond that, all of you ladies and I would say that all of you who are believers. See, the concept of motherhood is nice but The work is overwhelming, as we just heard. Loving your family is an honor, but it sometimes feels like a curse because of the pain that's involved. And the idea that God invented motherhood is factually correct, but God needs some people to prove that motherhood is a wonderful thing. And you are doing that. And you have been commended by these other ladies. You have been commended for what you have done. And and those of you who are not mothers but are mother figures, you have also been spoken to today. God speaking to you and telling you, this this life that I put you in, whether you're married or unmarried, whether you have kids or not, whether your kids... Are, are kind to you or not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you have the life of Job. I need somebody who will trust me. I need somebody who will let me live through them no matter what's happening. Yeah. The Bible teaches this in Titus chapter 2. I'm going to read it from the Living Translation, or the Living Bible, rather. Titus is being instructed by Paul. Teach the older women to be quiet and respectful in everything they do. They must not go around speaking of evil of others, must not be heavy drinkers, but they should be teachers of goodness. These older women must train the younger women to live quietly, to love their husbands and their children, and to be sensible and clean-minded, spending their time in their own homes, being kind and obedient to their husbands so that the Christian faith can't be spoken against by those who know them. In other words, God is trusting some of you mothers, some of you women, to defend his church, to defend his character, to defend who he is. He's saying, I'm trusting some of you to go out there and live such a life of kindness and love, even though you're mistreated, even though the world doesn't understand you, you're gonna go out there and you're gonna look like holy people, whether anybody understands that or not. And I, my hat's off, especially to your women, you women who represent holiness and represent purity and represent morality. You don't take your clothes off so men can gawk at you. You don't, you don't make yourself look attractive to people who are not going to treat you right. You're, you're dressing for him. You're, you're, you're showing the world. I don't care if you think I'm a prude. I don't care if you think that I'm out of date. I don't care if you think I'm old fashioned. I am dressing for him. I can do that in, in this century. So I'd like to invite all the women to the altar first. If all of you ladies, whether you're mother or not, if all of you women could come and just fill the altar and come close enough so the men can gather in behind you. As soon as these women get in place, I'd like for you men to get uh, in proximity with a a woman that you're uh, tied to, wife or child relative we see our world is broken we see how sin and hurt inspired by the devil have been so effective, have wounded so many people that right now in the streets of our cities, women are screaming, let me kill my baby. My full-term baby. 
my just born baby, my late term baby. Don't tell me I can't do that. And now there are groups that are targeting churches on Mother's Day. Now, we're kind of blessed to be out here in the boonies. We're down to downtown New York. We might have to have security watching for people who are targeting churches on Mother's Day. Now, when a society is, is protesting motherhood, something's wrong. But that's because some people have been hurt. That's because some men have hurt some women and some mothers have hurt some daughters. And, and so I think it's wrong and I'm going to speak against it, but I'm speaking against the devil, not against the hurt people. There are people who do things because they really think this is the solution. They're looking for the answer. But when Jesus came, he, he was in a society that had slaves. He didn't protest slavery. He was in a society that was twisted and, and the highest levels of, of politicians were uh, transgender and homosexual and abusive. They killed their own family members. He didn't protest them. He lived in a society that was massively offending uh, human rights. And what did Jesus do? He went about doing good. He said, I'm going to come into a detestable society. I'm going to walk among people who are, who, are, who are having parties where they have sex with everybody who's there. And they think it's normal. I'm going to live in a Roman world who that's so far gone that in a few years it's going to collapse upon itself. I'm going to live there and I'm going to do so much good that everybody's going to know there's a God. Everybody's going to know the miraculous can happen. I'm going to go touch the women who are accused of adultery. I'm going to go touch the women who had five husbands. They've been hurt. They're trying to find their way through life. I'm just going to love them. I'm just going to do good to them. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do good everywhere I go. And that goodness is going to show the world that there is a God. So church... I, I know God from time to time might have some people stand up against evil like the Wilberforces that stood up against slavery. But in general, what God wants you to do is go out there and be loving and holy. Go out there and dress like God wants you to dress and act like God wants you to act and treat people like God wants you to treat people. And your goodness, your goodness will defend him. Your goodness will stand out to the world. Your good, not your sign that says, I hate people who hate me. I'm not saying it's wrong to protest time to time. I believe in pro-life, but I don't think it does much good just to protest. I think if, if I can be a, a decent person, a loving person, if I can know God and connect with people and introduce them, God will take care of that abortion business through those personal relationships that happens. That's why we have prayer groups. You are proof there's a good God. You are proof there's grace. You are proof that there's mercy. You're proof that not everybody strikes back when they're struck. Mothers are a wonderful gift to mankind. And I, it grieves me that there are people that are protesting motherhood. And I'm going to say something about it like I just did. But I'm not going to get mad and go online and make a big stink and go take out a billboard. Uh, no, I'm going to help a dozen mothers go out and be good mothers this, this week. I'm going, to, I'm going to try to help you as women to go out there and be strong women. Be women of character. Be women who know who they are. Be women who aren't do, playing into the hands of the world that wants you to look a certain way and act a certain way. And be used by the system. We need strong women who look at society who's trying to make them feel 
less than a woman for staying home with their kids and say, this is what I chose to do. And if God didn't lead you that way, well then say, God led me to do this. But I, I don't have to feel bad because I don't fit society because society is crashing. Society is killing their babies. Society is protesting motherhood. Mothers, as has been said, are a wonderful gift. I want to say to you women, I value those of you who embrace, embrace your femininity. And that doesn't necessarily mean prissiness. I mean, not every, not every woman has the same mannerisms. You can still be feminine, loving, gentle. And then like my mom, she had a hose about that long, that big, big around, and left pretty good welts on, on the legs of boys who didn't have pants on. That's a feminine. That was a feminist. She was in charge of us boys. Although she didn't feel like it at times, I'm sure. There aren't enough flowers and chocolates to express how wonderful you women are and how much of a difference you make in our world. It's no wonder the enemy is coming against the distinction of sexes and motherhood because it's a kingpin. If he can make mothers bitter for having kids, having the, the problem of having kids and just turn them over to state to raise them, nobody teach them about manners and nobody teach them about thank you notes and nobody teach them about how they ought to treat their, parent, their parents right and their, their kids right. Nobody washing their mouth out with soap anymore. Before you know it, your society collapses like Rome collapsed. But rather than bemoaning our society going downhill, God has again and again focused Acts 2 on this. I'm going to do work in this last day. People are going to look at you and they're going to know that I'm there because of you. So you need to identify this, women. Every time you feel frumpy, every time you feel like you're out of step with society, every time you feel like you're not some diva so your life is not full, I want to tell you those divas are taking drugs. They can't hardly even make it to the stage to be a diva. They're miserable. But you have fullness. You, even in the pain, even in getting up early, even in doing the wash, there's a fullness to life that you have. And, and the love of God is just oozing out of you whenever you take care of other people. But, but society comes along and people who want your money come along and say, you you owe it to yourself. Send me $100,000 and I'll make you happy. Max your charge card out and go get everything you want. And you, you deserve, you know, three months off and maybe an affair while you're at it because you should be happy. And, and what is that? That's the enemy as an angel of light coming and trying to take away the most precious thing that you have. So you are precious to God. You are are going to prove to some people that there is a God when in the last days, when everybody's screaming, me, 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 don't you tell me what I can do, can't do. There's somebody who's getting up in the morning saying, God, my life is yours. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll love whoever you want me to love. So men, we need to pray for our ladies. We need to tell them we value them. They're hearing too many voices that tell them they're not valuable. They need to hear it from you. So I wonder if you'd step up close to one of the ladies here and you would, ladies, you might even want to join hands with one another and let's just pray, pray that God would shine brightly through all the ladies of Acts 2 Ministries. Would you pray for them right now? God, we come to you. Asking, Lord, for a great move of your spirit. A move of love, a move of grace, a move of mercy. Lord, use these ladies to flow out into our lives, into our community. They're billboards, Lord. Other people look at them and see, look, there's people who still love God. There's still some people who don't 
play the tune that everybody's asking them to play. They're not dancing to the world. They're living to an almighty God. Their lives are committed. They're willing to stand out. They're willing to stand up. They're willing to live a life that's pleasing to you, even though the world is calling on them to give up their motherhood, to give up their femininity, to give up their kindness and their mercy and their love. Let your love flow right now, God. Let your strength flow right now. Let fresh anointing flow right now into every one of them in Jesus' name. have a wonderful day. Um, Mothers, never stop praying for your kids. Never give up hope. And men, feel free to to, um, shower your wife with your mother with gifts today and have a wonderful day. God bless you.